With the median age in Canada now hovering around 41 years old, it's not surprising that the country's workforce is aging too, particularly with baby boomers gliding into their golden years. That's good for some people, but a real challenge for others, and not always in ways you might expect. Joining us now to examine how workers and employers are handling aging at work, Lisa Taylor, president of Challenge Factory, which deals with the 50-plus workforce and career transitions. Stephanie McKendrick, a career coach and consultant, and David Baker, lawyer and principal at Baker Law in Toronto. And it's good to welcome you three here to TVO tonight for a topic that is very timely, obviously. Let's read this from the Globe and Mail to get us started, shall we? Unprecedented numbers of older workers are staying in the workplace for longer than ever before. In the past decade, the number of Canadian workers over 65 has spiked more than 140%. The number of workers over 55 has surged 67% to more than 3.7 million. The labor force participation rate, that's the number of people either working or seeking to work as a percentage of the population, for people over 65 has nearly doubled to almost 14%, while participation in the 60 to 64 group has jumped 10 percentage points to nearly 55%. Okay, this all suggests, Lisa, to you first, that this notion of mandatory retirement at age 65 is kind of a quaint old notion. So let's start with this. How have employers adjusted to this new reality? I think that employers are slow to adjusting to the new reality. I think from a policy perspective, career paths, looking at training plans, even the language we use about the older worker and the aging workforce is, uh, is out of date and reinforces that there's this goalpost that everyone's working towards at age 65. Um, that well, get specific about that then. If we were talking about older workers today, what are we talking about? What age? Well, so when the retirement age was set at 65, it was the 30s and life expectancy was only 62. Hmm. So if we're going to talk about the older worker, you know, the retirement policies when they were originally brought in were really policies for the aged. So my question back would be, you know, why are we putting workplace policies for the aged for a population that's nowhere near being aged yet? So obviously you're suggesting we ought to forget about retiring at 65 uh, you know, by requirement, and should start to think about working for how long? Well, there's some really interesting policy that's coming out of the U.S. Some economists there have said, instead of looking at birth forward to set a date of when you no longer are going to be useful in the workforce, let's look at death backwards. Hmm. Let's have everyone age in their own way. And aging starts, I, I'm aging, my 14-year-old is aging, everyone's aging. Um, but let's age and let's put policies in place to help people when they actually need to start the true dictionary definition of the word to retire, to withdraw, to conclude. That's what the word means. It doesn't mean um, having a 30-year vacation. <laughs> so if we're going to, if we're going <laughs> to, that's an interesting way to put it. So if we're going to put policies in place, let's start from the assumption that on average people are going to live 80 plus years and then work backwards from there. Correct. You got it. Okay. Uh, David, let me get you into this conversation now because you represent a lot of people who are in the so-called, I guess, blue collar trades uh, and some of them that aren't so blue collar, like pilots as well, I guess, are, are uh, the colors are not blue and that's a pretty um, important job. And it used to be a job where they told you at 65 you got to stop working. What's the new reality for them? Well, I mean, as we just heard, the reality is, is certainly changing. Uh, in terms of blue collar, I, I think the, uh, uh, the issue, the big issue from my perspective is that seniority that was available through and under collective agreements to protect older workers, to extend the lives of older workers, is disappearing as unionization is uh, suffering setbacks in the private sector. And it's less of an issue in terms of public sector where uh, uh, most jobs uh, are not uh, uh, that type of job, although nursing and so on, these are real issues for, yeah. for people in those, in those areas. Um, pilots were mandatorily retired at age 60 until very, very recently. Um, pilots had to go overseas to find employment uh, after age 60, even though they were perfectly capable of flying and they were in high demand in other airlines. Well, that's the record. Let me just, let, let's confirm that. What kind of diminution of skills for a pilot is there once he or she has reached 60 years of age? Absolutely none. I mean, the greatest uh, pilots in history, Sully Sullenberger, put down in the Hudson uh, as he would have been uh, put out to pasture under <clears throat> the Canadian mandatory retirement rules. So uh, that, that's not an issue. With the uh, health advances that we have and the assessments that pilots go through, um, age really isn't uh, isn't the determining factor at so all. So let's compare then, Stephanie, what what older workers want out of a job and what younger workers want out of a job. 
Similarities, differences, what do you see? I think there's a lot of similarities. I think that as people age, they, they've had the chance to have different experiences. They've uh, developed their careers. They have some perspectives. And I think they probably have uh, a better sense of judgment and, and a different way of looking at things. But I think people want meaningful work. And I think that people want to continue making a contribution uh, long past when we think of, uh, as Lisa said, you know, uh, the, the policies were put in place because you're supposed to be dead by the time you got a pension. <laughs> um, but people want to do things. They may not want to do it exactly the same way as a younger person, but um, there's a huge gap in between, I think, what people want to do when they've had experience and, and when they are at that age, which is close to what we used to think of as retirement. And I know, you know, people are working, depending on their situation, into their 70s, into their 80s. Well, Hazel McCallion both plays hockey. And, you know... I'm not sure how much hockey Hazel's not playing now, anymore, but... But she played, you But know, she was married till 93. Married till 93, yeah. played hockey, you know, well into her life. And, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, certainly not typical. And I think it's a rare person who's got the capacity physically mm -hmm. to run a large municipality well into their 90s. But it's not as rare as I think people think it is. No, fair enough. But I want to pick up on one expression you used in the middle of that answer, which was... People want to continue having meaningful work into their 60s, 70s, and who knows, even for some 80s, but with some minor adjustments. Now, yeah. what does that entail? Well, I think it depends on, on the kind of work it is. Um, and I think that uh, when, you're, when, you have, um, when you're older and you've, you've done all, all sorts of things in your career, uh, it, it's very disheartening, for instance, to think, well, if I'm not going to be in my corporate role, uh, where would I go? Uh, you don't want to go back to when you were a student and work in retail. Um, consulting is, is, a, is a, a kind of um, a field where I think it's the, the larger firms are more prevalent. It's harder to be an independent consultant. But I guess what I'm wondering is if, you, if you've worked, you know, the sort of classic 60, 70, 80 hour weeks as yeah. a high powered executive, whatever, for five days, six days a week, seven days a week in some cases, and now you're 70 and you want to just sort of slow down a little bit but keep contributing. Yep. Are employers savvy enough to be able to kind of put, put something together whereby maybe you work three days a week and still contribute? I think they have a lot of work to do. And I think you mentioned something very important, which is an expectation that people should, as a normal course of events, work 60, 70, 80 hour weeks has all sorts of inherent flaws in it. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't hold that up as an example that you want to work toward. I think that it tends to be all or nothing. And so either you, you get into this kind of paradigm where it's you just put everything else on hold, you don't have any physical needs, you don't have any social needs, emotional needs, you just go flat out. And I think that uh, not only would senior workers benefit um, quite a bit, but if there's a more flexible approach where you can do meaningful work on a part-time or scaled back basis with some flexibility, and it doesn't mean that you just kind of come in whenever you feel no, like no, you I show up. Let me yeah. put that to Lisa. Do, do you see employers uh, demonstrating sort of flexible or savvy enough possibilities of changing in order to accommodate this new reality? Yeah, I, I think that we are starting to see some in, in all kinds of ways. So for some, it's because they're recognizing that 20 extra years of productivity is a good competitive advantage. And if everyone's going to leave and go work somewhere else, why not retain that knowledge and have access to that knowledge? So whether that's through direct employment um, extension or whether that's through new emerging programs like alumni programs where we're keeping in touch with our alumni as they move on and do a portfolio of new activities in their um, in their later years uh, there's all kinds of new models that are emerging there's new companies that are emerging as well so new platforms are coming into the market to recognize that there's an entire population of people that don't necessarily want to or can't continue doing what they have been doing but don't want to do nothing. Mm -hmm. And so the platforms are being the matchmakers between the employers that are looking for talent and the talent that's seeking a way to be able to continue to use their skills. You just used an expression I haven't heard before. Alumni workers? I mean, I thought that was something you use when somebody graduates from post-secondary. Really interesting, right? Yeah. So the post-secondary institutions know that uh, once someone has spent time within their brand, they're actually the largest brand advocates, the largest donors. They know the, they're great for recruiting new students. All of those principles actually carry over into business. One of the largest challenges organizations have today is recruiting new talent. Mm -hmm. Who's better than being a recruiter than someone who's been a 30-year 
veteran within the organization who can now help in all kinds of ways, maybe not doing the function or the skill that they used to do because they don't want to continue doing that anymore and, and the company is ready for someone else to be doing that work, but they would love to be the brand advocate on campuses to find great talent. David, in your experience, are you seeing companies jump on this sort of alumni slash brand ambassador role? I think uh, that's not the norm by any means at all. I mean, I think what we're really going through right now is uh, a post-mandatory retirement reality where uh, a lot of employers uh, are make assumptions and they've designed their, their management systems based on their being turnover at age 60, 65. And uh, the reality is that that's not necessarily when people choose to uh, retire at all based on choice in many cases and necessity and many others. And, and so uh, assumptions that you're gone at, at 65 are, are still out there. The management systems are still there. The, the assumptions of supervisors, the, the plans for renewal and so on, all of those things are premised on something which changed when mandatory retirement went out. How do you see it, Stephanie? Well, I think that mandatory retirement at age 65 or 60, whatever the, the rule is, is kind of the, I wouldn't call it the least of the concerns, but I, you know, what I've seen in, in, in my practice and, and working with Challenge Factory is there's a lot of uh, people who are much younger than 60 or 65 who are having to reinvent and reimagine their careers. And it, it can be very difficult if the perception is we don't want to invest in someone who and it's a myth, but we don't want to invest in someone who's going to leave. If you look at the average tenure, it, that shouldn't be an issue. And I think that uh, it, it puts a lot of stress on people. If you think about the gap, you know, when the, when the supports come in, if you are changing careers at, in your early 50s and finding it difficult and having to take time to uh, find something new or different or another position, um, or you have to, to change the type of work you do, that's a long gap between, say, 52 and... 67, you know, mm -hmm. when, so the, what happens between 52 and 67? And that's one of the things that we're trying to help with is how, let's find meaningful things for people to do. There's a shocking amount of talent that's left on the table, lying around, people with incredible skills, experience, judgment, and they're just on the periphery having a really hard time trying to find their way in. Because and of ageism? Because of ageism and also because of the way people are selected for work and there's a whole process around um, keywords and, and it's more technical. People need support to find new work. And I think that there are a number of factors at play, but what you find is people in their 50s and 60s with incredible experience, great insights, um, they've got people skills, they've got management skills, they've got good judgment, and they're finding it hard to find a role. And I think companies probably would like to have them, but they I don't think they've figured out how do we find these people and, and how do we change the way we do things so that we can take advantage of the talent? You want to pick up on that? I do. I think that there's a lot of myths that are out there that drive employers to make bad choices or to actually not even have the information that they need to know that they're making a choice. Um, and I also think that there are so many elements of the world of work that are changing all at the same time. Demographics and aging is one component of what we're seeing change, but we're also seeing a change to freelance economy, new employment structures, new reviews of old policies. And I think as all of these changes are taking place at the same time, sometimes it can get confusing and things get left by the side. So for example, the aging workforce, which is, uh, again, such an interesting term to me. You don't like the term. Well, I, I wish that we will come up with another term in, mm -hmm. in the future. Um, but I think that, uh, you know, taking a look at how aging plays into the life course of our career trajectory is something that often gets left by the side. There's a new report that just came out today, a review of workplace practices in Ontario. And you know, in it, there's one mention in the entire kind of summary of the fact that older workers are also experiencing difficulty, but no discussion of the implications of even using terms like working age Canadians and defining that 18 to 64 over and over and over again. What does that do for the mindset of the employer who's taking cues and just trying to do the right thing? Well, can I, okay. I have your permission to do this. Let's state this up front, right? Because you don't mind telling people how old you are. I don't mind. Of course, I don't mind telling people how okay. old I am. So, I mean, the reason I raise this is this is not an academic discussion for you. I mean, you've, you've been in this position, right? Sort of? 
Oh, you excuse me, this Stephanie, up. you've been in this position. <laughs> Stephanie, forgive me. That's I got okay. this. I got this all backwards. I don't mind it at all. But and, that's and, okay. But it's not going where you want it you, to go. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> you, you don't have to tell me how old you are if you don't want. But it's Stephanie who sometimes sure. doesn't mind fessing up to the fact that you are sixty-two and needed a career change at what time? Fifty-eight. At fifty-eight. Yep. And did what therefore? So. I decided to um, reinvent my career. I, I, I did toy with the idea of, of trying to pursue the same thing. I was a not-for-profit uh, leader. I ran an organization for 16 years um, that helped women advance in their careers. So um, it, it's very hard at that age to get hired into a full-time role. Um, and it's not impossible, but it's very difficult. So and the, just for the record, at 58, you decided, I want to do something else, right? Yeah, the, the job that I had was totally changing. The not-for-profit world has radically changed. There's been a sea change, so it's not the same, the, the same opportunities aren't there. And there are a number of things that I'd wanted to do, take up hockey again, uh, <laughs> which I did and since I wasn't traveling, so I could actually join a team. But I also, um, the work I did at, uh, it was Canadian Women in Communications, was helping women to advance in their careers. And I wanted to continue that work, so and you were I, the CEO, weren't you? Yes, I was. Yeah, and and we did so much work there that I think was valuable, and I think um, needs to be continued in a different way. So that I took as my mission, and so I do career coaching and I do consulting for companies uh, who want to do a better job at at uh, retaining and advancing women. But okay, yeah. presumably you looked out at the workforce, and you yeah. you know you ran into a. You ran into a situation where at 58, people are not necessarily open to, right? No. They're not welcoming. No, and, and the, so you especially at that, that, uh, at that level. Um, so I had to reinvent myself. And the, and the thing that gets very tricky is if you find yourself um, you know, in your 50s or even in your 60s, um, and, and we didn't, my husband had ran his own business. I don't have a pension. He doesn't have a pension. Uh, I want to work. And I, I still feel I have a lot to contribute, but uh, you have to find something to do and it takes time. So a lot of people, even when they're reinventing their careers, they have to build in that time to, um, to switch gears. And probably the most difficult thing is a sense of identity and confidence. Um, kind of being unmoored, uh, if you've been used to being in the harness, mm. is hard for most people, and most people don't expect it, and it, it can absolutely wreak havoc. And people, I've, I've had clients who have incredibly good qualifications who spent two years, uh, you know, in their early to mid-50s looking to reestablish to get another job. Let me and, follow up with yeah. Lisa on that, because as workers get older and they start to feel marginalized because they don't have that superstar place in the workplace they used to have, what does that do to them? Yeah, so it's really challenging. The whole identity issue that Stephanie was just referring to is, is really the most one of the most significant challenges that they face internally. The, the external ageism that's taking place in the workplace only is kind of a self-reinforcing circle that they have to deal with. But it's very difficult to realize that you are all of a sudden a previously important person, that the only way that you can introduce yourself at cocktail parties is in the past tense. I used to be the director of, I used to be. That, that's not a healthy way to be able to look ahead, especially when, as we've been saying, it, it's not a short period of time that you have. It's long enough to be able to make a significant mm -hmm. transition. So really thinking through separating what I do with who I am is something that is, it's particularly tricky, and it's particularly tricky for Canadians. Canadians introduce themselves with their job title more than almost any other country on the planet. Other places may use where they went to school or where they grew up or what sports team they have allegiance to, but we use our job. And so when that's all of a sudden no longer true, it's very disheartening and it's very, it's, it's um, unsettling for many people. Well, David, having said that, let me echo to you what I hear from employers occasionally, which is, I favor younger people over older people because I can train slash mold a younger person into doing things the way I want them done, which I can't do with an older person because they've got 35 years in the workforce and they want to do it their way and they're not interested in, in the way I want to do it. Now you hear that. Is that not the case? I think there are lots of myths as we've heard and the evidence is there, there's really strong evidence, Ontario evidence, about uh, employer attitudes that are based on stereotypes about older workers, about uh, 
uh, skills and technology and willingness to train and renew and so on. I mean, I, I, the big point I would make is that an awful lot of the renewal is to be taking place for employees with their current employers. That's where I think we're falling down hugely. The assumption had been that you were out at age 60 or age 65 and we aren't going to invest in you. That really is something that needs to change and change a lot. It's discriminatory in, in legal terms uh, what's happening uh, for those workers. Do you see intergenerational tension in the workplace between the younger people who want to get that foot in the door but feel rightly or wrongly, that the older person trying to hang on to that job is an obstacle to them starting their careers. Uh, there's an awful lot of that out there. Uh, there are supervisors who are younger, and they say, I don't want to supervise someone who's older. It would make me feel uncomfortable, or maybe it would make that person feel uncomfortable. But essentially, again, those are discriminatory attitudes that need to be overcome. I guess my first my first job, I was the youngest person by a significant margin, and I had to get used to the idea that I was supervising some people who were older than me, and, and that's just the way it is. How'd you do with that? Uh, well, I did it with uh, great difficulty in some situations where I was uh, uh, considered a bit uh, brash, perhaps, but the, the bottom line was that uh, I welcomed their skills and recognize that they had abilities that I didn't have, and I needed those abilities. It, it, I mean, we, we have to be blunt about this. It's, it's a tricky balance at times, right? There are some 60-plus-year-olds who don't want some 30-year-old whippersnapper telling them how to do a job. And, you know, as David just indicated, there's some 30-year-olds who feel quite uncomfortable about telling somebody twice their age how to do it. There's also how do you 30, negotiate all that? There's also 30-year-olds that don't want a 60-year-old telling them how to do their job. I, I mean, it goes both ways. So I think one of the starting points to look at how intergenerational collaboration actually leads to competitive advantage instead of conflict is to tease out what actually is a function of age, what's a function of personality, where are there performance issues that need to get addressed as performance issues at any age, and where are those being masked because either the person is young or the person is old, and how can we actually uh, focus on what the real issue is, which is that the world of work is changing. And even in all of those changes, it's interesting. David mentioned he was a young supervisor. I was certainly a young supervisor. I think Stephanie in her early career had to supervise people that are older than her. This is not a new phenomenon. I think what's new is the size of the demographics. So the boomers is a very large generation. The millennials is an equally large sized generation. Gen X in the middle was small. So the issues seem to be minimized because there weren't as many of us. Where now we have a large population on both ends of the spectrum and that's where the conflict is coming. This it's is more going to be an numbers. increasing phenomenon, isn't it? I agree. Looking forward. Okay, in which case, we, we sort of touch on ageism as we've conducted our discussion here and I want to get a better sense from you about whether men or women, I guess men and women, experience ageism in the workplace differently. Do they? Um, I think they probably do depending on how, how um, identified they are with their careers. I think sometimes um, in terms of society, they're harder on men who have no role. I think for women, they face uh, specific challenges that don't get any better with age, if not worse. So I think it, you know, whether you're male or female, um, it's, a, it's a very difficult thing to be without uh, without work or trying to figure out what the next thing is and who you are and how you can how you can re-enter and as Lisa said you know you go to a cocktail party and you're the person who used to do this or mm. that and for some people that's fine other people it's devastating because they haven't thought beyond um, you know what what they are in relation to their mm. to their work so the supports that are needed are very different and, and Lisa again has said that the workplace has to to um, to change to accommodate it. I think there has to be a lot more support in terms of helping people through, and it's a lot of the work that that we do is to help with the confidence and give people that platform that they can go out and reinvent themselves, or per, or to really do a focus campaign to to land again, because people sometimes want to continue whether they're 40, 50, 60. Well, let's read this from the New Yorker magazine, which speaks to the decline in the value of experience. Here's Benjamin Wallace Wells writing, The return to experience is a way to describe what you get in return for aging. It describes the increase in wages that workers normally see throughout their careers. The returned experience tends to be higher for more skilled jobs. 
A doctor might expect the line between what she earns in her first year and what she earns in her 50s to rise in a satisfyingly steady upward trajectory. A coal miner might find it depressingly flat, but even workers with less education and skills grow more efficient the longer they hold a job, and so paying them more makes sense. Unions, in arguing for pay that rises with seniority, invoke a belief in the return to experience. It comes close to measuring what we might otherwise call wisdom. Okay, do we put a premium on wisdom in this workplace? What, what's your experience on this, Lisa? I, I don't think we necessarily do, and it, it depends really on the sector and on what's happening. As the world of work continues to change so much, the nature of the jobs change, and so how up to date is the person um, staying in order to be able to continue to apply their wisdom? Um, there's also a, an interesting dynamic that says because someone is older, then they must be wise, and those com that combination isn't necessarily true mm. either. There's wisdom that can come, again, from the workplace in all different ages, sizes, spaces, um, from all different places. And so really what we need to be focusing on is as people move through their careers and their career segments, as we move from the foundational career where we start to mid-career, what comes after mid-career before we're really ready to retire? Let's focus on how we can take the experiences we have and apply it to what's needed in the workforce today in a way that doesn't necessarily just say, if you've just spent 20 years in a career and you're going to be living and working longer, well, guess what? Now you've got to spend 40 years in that same career. Hmm. How can we make it so it's easier for people to transition with purpose in ways that are good for their own identity and good for their skills, but also meet a need that employers are looking for? Can I ask you about the advisability of post-secondary education then for the older worker? Because no one today blanches at all when you consider someone in their high 20s or even 30s going sort of back to college or back to university to get retrained uh, or have their skills upgraded in some particular area, would you think it advisable for someone in their late 50s or 60s or 70s to go back to post-secondary to get skills upgraded or changed? I, I think, you know, it's a, it's a great idea if people have the, the means and the opportunity. I'd say my point is that uh, employers have the responsibility to be offering training to older workers, and if there's one area of clear discrimination experienced by older workers, it's that they're denied training on the basis of assumptions, stereotypes, as we've said, mm -hmm. that uh, people aren't going to stay around much longer. Um, so they'll pay to send a kid to go get his MBA or her MBA, but maybe not for someone who's 60. Absolutely right, and those are a number of the cases that I've been involved in. And workers saying, I'm not going to put up with this. I, I need to be given the same opportunity the younger workers have to get the training so I can maintain the skills, maintain my place in the workplace and have a future. Lisa. And it's not even external post-secondary education or retraining. I think David raises a really good point. You know, in our analysis across the country, one of the things that we found was that there is a significant drop-off in commitment to workplace training of Canadian employees starting at around age 49. Mm -hmm. So 49 is still a very far way away before age 65 if we are going to use that as a milestone. And even still, the subtle signals inside of organizations still start to tell the person that, you know what, it's time for you to kind of withdraw a bit, that we're not going to necessarily give you the same level of training as we would to a younger employee. And then what ends up happening is that employee stays for decades in the organization, and 10 years, 12 years later, there's then discussions about, you know, why Sue or why Bob's skills are out of date. Well, mm. they haven't been trained in all of that time. That's something, though, that we're seeing, I suspect, across sectors and across demographics in the Canadian workplace. There's just a lot less on-site retraining going on nowadays, isn't there? There is. Compared to, say, 25 years ago. Okay, let's do, Sheldon, should we do this um, bottom of page four here, this Toronto Star editorial board? Let's do this excerpt here. Abundant research has also shown that encouraging older workers to stay in the labor market will require significant culture change. The Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives found Negative stereotypes about older workers were a significant barrier to their continuing to work. Tackling this problem involves changing the mindset of human resources policies so that employers focus on retaining seniors and even hiring them rather than pushing them out the door. For too long, there has been a culture of pushing seniors out the door or encouraging them to leave through buyouts to make room for the young. Okay, Stephanie, there it is in black and white. How are we going to do this? Well, I think it's uh, I think it's a really difficult uh, it's a really difficult situation. But I think that you need to train workers, and I think that they need to feel supported, and they need to um, um, they need to be 
seen as individuals. But well, we need a cult. The, 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 the star culture. editorial is saying you've got to change the mindset and the culture of the people who hire. And that's that's where I was going. The the, the culture is. There's a formula that I can use by using internet search or, or some system where I will just pluck the, you know, the right qualifications and people need to be seen for who they are and especially um, when you're looking at things like judgment and leadership and the things that I think some of the older workers bring, um, it's harder to put in a resume and keywords. Um, you, you need to speak, actually speak to people and you need to see that. So. There is a huge culture change that has to take place. They have to think totally differently about how you see and value workers. And again, it, it, we were talking about the 60, 80, 90, 100 hour week. Um, you don't want to have a 70 year old person necessarily saying that's what you do or you don't do anything. Mm -hmm. But you could say that you could uh, meaningfully uh, spend a couple of days a week, um, and each person is going to be different. And that you, you can't just categorize, and this is the tricky part, because you just can't say all 65-year-olds are fine, mm -hmm. uh, or no 70-year-olds are fine. OK, but let me jump in here, because uh, with a few minutes mm -hmm. left here, I do need to put this on the table. The millennials who are watching this program right now are saying to themselves, all you people only care about the 60 plus and meanwhile these people are blocking I'm sure they're saying these people are blocking our opportunities to finally get into the workforce and instead I mean I got my first full-time job when I was 21 you know it's nothing to see Millennials nowadays in their 30s still looking for that first job what are we, I mean do we not have any sympathy for them here? Yeah, so of course, there's lots of sympathy, and of course, there needs to be solutions for youth unemployment. Unfortunately, what often happens is the fact that we're going through a period of high youth unemployment is often connected to the fact that people are staying in the workplace longer. And those things are connected, but not in the way that you would think. So a study of OECD uh, countries has actually shown that in, in countries where there's high participation rates among older workers, youth unemployment drops. And the reason for that is because if older workers with all of their experiences are properly employed, in a, it, to go to the quote that you mentioned earlier, that leverages the experience they have and the wisdom, they will pull with them entry level positions that need to support the work that they're doing. That goes so, against everything we hear. It does indeed. And that's where myth busting becomes such an important part of this discussion, that the headline doesn't always necessarily give the full story. And ageism in the workplace is such a real, um, it's, it's such a real issue, not just for the HR manager, but in our own minds as well. I mean, every single day, the same employees that are combating ageism in their own careers will make age deprecating jokes among their friends and family. So the culture change is really a society wide culture change where we need to recognize that you know, we don't make certain statements anymore against someone's race, against someone's religion, against someone's sexuality, against someone's gender identity, but we make comments about someone's age all the time and we laugh. It's one of the last bastions of acceptable, I mean, acceptable discrimination and joking in the workplace, isn't it? Is it is indeed, and, and that makes it difficult not just for the HR manager and the company, but for all of us to realize, wait a minute, there's decades of productivity that we're not accessing, and that's a shame. Well, I want to thank the three of you for coming in tonight and helping us understand this phenomenon a whole heck of a lot better. Stephanie McKendrick from McKendrick & Associates International, Lisa Taylor from The Challenge Factory, and David Baker from Baker Law. Good to have all of you on us, uh, with us on TVO tonight. And you can tell me how old you are later. <laughs> <laughs> Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.